next speaker is Lee Orff from Central Michigan University, and Lee is going to tell us about simulating and visualizing the most devastating thunderstorms. Well, thank you for coming out, and indeed I'm going to be talking about uh, some recent work with my collaborators, um, Robert Wilhelmson at uh, the University of Illinois and NCSA, and Lou Wicker at the National Severe Storms Laboratory. So this is the result of some work that's been going on for a little while. If I had to sort of summarize what we're doing, we're simply trying, well, simply, we're trying to simulate a storm that naturally produces the most devastating tornado, a long track EF5. When I say naturally, I mean it should just form within the simulation without any coaxing. And then we want to do two things. We want to visualize the storm in ways that both enable comparisons to field studies, this is very important, and also to bring out processes that are not visible um, using uh, traditional methods. And then we want to do this for many storms so we can actually do some good science. So basically, if I had to sort of look at the process overall, we have a massively parallel cloud model that moves data from memory to disk, and we need to do this in an efficient manner. And this took up the bulk of the work of this project. Uh, we want to save data in an actively developed uh, format that is still um, that's, you know, relatively easy to use. We're using HDF5 in this case. Um, and then on top of that, we want to build some middleware that provides an easy window to the data because the data is going to be spread out amongst lots of files in lots of ways. And um, then we want to interface using this middleware to visualization tools and um, make movies and pictures and do science. Finally, um, I've been spending some more time on post-production. I noticed some of the talks here have done the same. So we want to do things like annotate, blend, pan, do transitions, etc. So let me talk about the model. The model is called CM1. It was developed by George Bryan at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. It's in Fortran. It uses a hybrid MPI OpenMP architecture, non-blocking communication, HDF5 using the core driver to buffer writes to memory, 2D domain, doc, domain composition. Um, we're running also on the Blue Water supercomputer. The simulation I'm going to show you uses 20,000 cores out of the available 700,000 or so cores. We hope to use more in the future. We chose HDF5 because it uh, is flexible, has good support on HPC machines like Blue Waters. I've been in touch with the developers several times to help work out kinks and issues I've had. I've settled on a format where I use one file per, per node, about 100 time levels per file, file, and I buffer these all to memory, one per node, flush them all to the disk concurrently. Blue Waters seems to do pretty well with this type of I.O., uh, with the Luster file system, the way they have it configured. A little bit about the middleware I developed. Essentially, directories and files form a very strict naming system that is then uh, utilized by the reading algorithms. So I basically you point to the top level directory where all the data lives, it goes out, it gets metadata using some low level uh, C commands. And once we have that metadata, it's sort of a handshake. And then the calling program, whether it's a visualization program or a conversion program, requests the following things, a variable at a given time, over a given domain in a pointer that's been allocated to that. So this is really nice because you can pick a plane, a point, a line, or a three-dimensional cube. It just comes, spits the data back. So you can do all sorts of stuff. Now that you have the, the middleware, the interface, the data, you can now do some interesting things or some very mundane things, but important. Like if you want to share a time level, you might want to just produce a single net CDF file, and that is done uh, very straightforward. What kind of techniques do we use? Well, thunderstorms are very photogenic. What I mean by that is they have a nice height to width aspect ratio that sort of begs three-dimensional volume rendering and things like that. So I'm using Visit, uh, Vapor, and to a smaller extent, vis 5 d um, Again, volume rendering, trajectories, isosurfaces, pseudocolor planes, and vectors. And um, whenever possible, when I'm doing large batch jobs, I use the Visit Python interface, uh, spit out a bunch of uh, uh, Python files to do uh, large render jobs and um, that works out pretty well. We've had some challenges. We've had some issues specific to our application, mem memory utilization issues, volume rendering, some issues with vapor and performance on large data sets, but essentially we managed to work our way around these problems to, uh, to create the movies I'm going to show you shortly. So the scientific challenge to this problem, um, we're trying to capture the most devastating and rare tornado that actually forms in any thunderstorm and have it go on for a long time, a long track EF5, as it's called. So we're trying to grow the least common tornado, the most devastating tornado. And as with real thunderstorms, simulated thunderstorms rarely produce these things. And it was not a foregone conclusion that we would actually get one, even though all our tools were in place, but we did, thankfully, or I wouldn't have much to talk to you about today. 
So let's take a look at this storm. I'm going to use start out with a far view, look at a volume rendered uh, field of the clouds. So you're looking at the overshooting top, the anvil, the mesocyclone. You'll see shortly the tornado and the wall cloud. Here's the, the domain we ran under, uh, 120 by 120 by 20 kilometers. Zooming in a little bit more, you start to see the tornado and the, the, this part right here where we're focusing a lot of our time. And when you look at this storm and you talk to an uh, observational meteorologist, they say, hey, this looks like what I see in the field. It's very gratifying. Another technique I use is to follow the track of the storm. This is the maximum surface velocities. This is the minimum pressure deficit or, uh, from the tornado. Um, I can talk about things going on here. I'm just panning across a large image, doing a little bit of annotation. With things that are like really long and skinny like this, this is useful because you can't cram this whole image on one screen. Even 4K won't do that very well. So I've been sort of exploring and ex experimenting with these kinds of panning around images to really bring things in, blending things in. This is re radar reflectivity. Here's our tornado right here. This is a view that meteorologists are used to. Uh, some interesting things are going on here and here. I now look at the surface cold pool of the storm. This is the rain-cooled storm-generated air behind the storm that actually gets recirculated back into the storm. Here's our tornado. Here's what's called the rear flank downdraft. These are warm pockets of air, which are very interesting. And it's cooler up here, and we're going to be focusing on what's going on here. So this is the quasi-photorealistic view of the storm as the tornado forms. Um, and basically, you're looking at the cloud. Um, as you'd expect, the tornado descends upward or, or downward from, from the wall cloud here. Um, this, again, is very exciting. We now have a rain curtain that sort of sweeps around the wall cloud. This is something that meteorologists have seen in the field as well. We see evidence of, of, of maybe vorti vorticity in the, what's called the forward flank of the storm. Um, the rain comes and goes. You start to see some interesting sub-vortical flows or sub-tornadic scale flows that are actually uh, seen in the field as well. And that's probably the most gratifying um, aspect of this type of visualization right now is because I can go to observational meteorologists and we can speak the same language because they're out in the field looking at this stuff and here I have a, re a representation using volume rendering techniques that we can communicate on the same level. Um, so this, the aim of this particular visualization is to present the tornado in a quasi-photorealistic manner. The tornado, which is the cloud field, and this is the rain field. So you get these pulsing downdrafts that are, that are actually important in the evolution of the tornado, and other things that show up pretty well with this type of visualization. But photorealism is only one thing. We also need to look into the, in, the interior of the storm. In this case, I'm also using volume rendering, but using uh, vapor and looking at the vorticity magnitude. So vorticity is just del cross V. It's the uh, curl of the wind vector. It shows you where rotation and shear is. So what, what pops out here, and I'm just going to go through a few things. This is an icy surface. This sort of ribbon of vorticity that's being drawn into the updraft of the storm and tilted vertically, this has never been seen at this kind, with this kind of fidelity before. So here we have the developing tornado right here. This is actually an anti-cyclonic uh, circulation. This is the updraft isosurface indicating that the updraft is essentially just sucking air from the surface and reconfiguring it in such a way as to help to keep maintaining it. And this is really exciting because we've never seen this before and visualization helps bring out these features. So you've seen this already. A is for anticyclonic, C is for cyclonic. Now I can compare what's going on visually with what's going on in the vorticity field. And notice you've already got a tornado going on here before it actually shows up. This is exciting. This means that there may be ways to sort of uh, you know, view what's going on in the storm and give us better forecasts of what's going on. So here's the vorticity field. You see all these little, uh, what are called mesocyclones, very small scale vortices that actually get absorbed into the main tornado. This again has never been seen with this kind of fidelity. But what you don't see is what's going on, and I'll be showing you shortly, uh, up in the upper part of the tornado cyclone. I'd also like to draw your attention to uh, sort of when you see red fields here, this is buoyancy. You see positively buoyant air, like right here, that's a positively buoyant uh, downdraft that in positively buoyant air is more likely to rise, and that enters the updraft and helps to keep it going, you think. And you see lots of really cool stuff like that too, where you get these horizontal rolls. Um, isosurfaces aren't too exciting, but they can be useful for showing multiple fields. And in this case, I'm choosing to show the updraft in red, the downdraft in blue, and the pressure perturbation in this other, uh, this greenish blue color here. Again, this is the surface buoyancy. Here are those warm um, downdrafts that seem to play a role. Another view looking back, just trying to convey what's going on here. What's going on right here is of, of great interest to meteorologists, these downdrafts. 
Again, ISIS services looking at pressure perturbation. So now we're actually looking at the tornado. So this is, as you'd expect, tornadoes are regions of low pressure. But this guy here, this lobe of, low, of, of pressure perturbation, is something that has showed up in, in, in coarser simulations, but not like this. And it turns out that this thing here is probably associated with this, this feature that I'm going to be focusing on next. So here we're looking at vorticity again and looking at surface potential temperature perturbation to sort of put those two there again to show these boundaries that are important. And this is an interesting shot. This is my favorite still of the whole movie. Um, here is that conveyor of vorticity that's going into the, into the tornado cyclone. Here are those little guys. Here's the tornado. Here's what's called vortex breakdown occurring. And here's an anticyclonic circulation. So this right here, this, I don't know what to call it yet. I call it the vorticity train. You know, I don't know. But it's essentially what's happening is the storm generates cold air, which generates horizontal vorticity that's then tilted into the vertical. So you have spin that's lying on the ground, and then you have spin that's basically erect. And as you know, tornadoes are vertically erect. And if there's anything we can do to help uh, get that tornado going, then uh, that's interesting to meteorologists. But you'll notice that this circulation is not directly interfaced with the tornado, and the visualization really draws this out quite nicely. This is, seems to be feeding the cyclone and the updraft that is then helping to uh, drive this huge tornado. So this is new. This in this kind of fidelity, and you're not going to see it with two-dimensional uh, contour plots. You're just not going to see it. So this 3D visualization has been extremely useful in helping to convey what's going on in this storm. So here we're releasing trajectories. Um, much of the air that fills the tornado actually originates in the colder region of the storm, which again is interesting because it's harder to lift cold air than it is to lift warm air. Um, so that's an interesting result. It's not an entirely new result, um, but this is really cool. So this is that sort of tube of vorticity. I'm just following it using trajectories. And again, you can see how it sort of wraps around the tornado and enters the tornado cyclone. And here uh, you can see these little guys here. Notice some of these little guys come from one side of the storm, one come from another. And this is called streamlined vorticity, and I've never seen it more uh, visually uh, shown like this before. So here's the wind vectors, or these are trajectories, and they're simply following the vorticity field. This is called streamlined vorticity. The vorticity vector and the velocity vector are, are pointing in the same direction, and that's important as well. Here I do steady state stream tubes and just move back across this, this boundary. Um, at this point, the storm is pretty steady, so you can see as I slide back and forth here, um, air out, the warm air ahead of the storm pretty much feeds the updraft that uh, encircles the tornado, but as you get over here into the cold pool, you can see how that air really is feeding the tornado at low levels, and that's another interesting result. Here I'm going to drop particles in what's called the rear flank downdraft of the storm, and just to see where the air goes, this is kind of turbulent, um, but pretty much this updraft is so strong, eventually almost all particles are going to end up in the updraft. It just might take a somewhat circuitous route. Here is that, uh, that ribbon of vorticity that, again, you can see is feeding the storm aloft, but it's not directly interfacing with the tornado. We see these things in storms called secondary RFD surges, where the storm just kind of blasts out a new uh, uh, blast of air that ends up getting into the updraft, and this visualization shows that quite well. I did a few backward integrated trajectories to see where the air comes from that enters the lower part of a tornado. We see that some of it enters from the cold side here, and some of it enters from the warm side. So that's another uh, useful result as well. Finally, I'm just dropping trajectories about a kilometer and a half above the ground, letting them go. What we see here is there's an actual downdraft in the center of this tornado, and that is good. That is what's called a two-celled structure. It's been observed in laboratory studies and in just tornado modeling studies where you just model the tornado. And our full cloud simulation also shows this two-celled structure. So you have air that is sinking in the tornado, and then it's recirculating and going upwards back in. And that is extremely gratifying. It seems like we really um, are getting things right in this simulation. So that's my last little clip. I'll end with a concluding slide and just say that, um, you know, what's next? We need to write this up. It's pretty much hot off the press. I want to probe these features I've talked about, compare to observations, uh, do more simulations and visualizations, and I want to do a lot of stereo, uh, do stereo pairs, I think. Um, I, have, I have, would like to view this stuff in stereo and, and share it with other people. I have uploaded this talk to a site, orf.media. You can get this exact talk, and um, it'll also show up at uh, the SC website at some point. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lee. Sure. Fantastic. Any questions for Lee? Yeah, Chris? Hi. Um, I just had a question about, uh, do you have any estimates about that particular simulation about the uh, possible wind speed or the amount of damage that's going to happen?
It's an EF5. We have 300 mile per, per hour winds at the surface. It's a devastating storm. It's not out of the realm of reality. There have been observations of winds of 300 miles an hour before, but this is the most devastating storm, and it's over. Um, it lasts for a really long time, so it's it's a it's a nasty storm. You would not want to be in this storm. And I didn't mention this, but it's also basically. Um, based upon an observation of a storm. We used uh, initial conditions from around a storm that produced this kind of damage. So that's also cool because then we can compare to the observations. Okay, let's thank you again. Good job.